Here in France, for example, it is not such a problem to order an MRI or uh, not an actual CT scan uh, in the first place, but it's not such a problem. If you have, if you have uh, any uh, sign of a TFCC injury, we can order an MRI. But in between, we, can, uh, we need to immobilize the patient. At six weeks, we uh, do a clinical assessment. If uh, there are some uh, sign of instability or some uh, sign on the MRI of TFCC injury, we can decide for a surgery, a secondary surgery. But it is not so frequent to decide the surgery in the acute situation. Right. Yes. There so, is another thing. Please, yeah. I, I would like to say. Sure. Uh, there is a, a different situation when we have a distal radius fracture. When we have a distal radius fracture that we, that we manage atroscopically, it's different. We uh, test the, the DRUJ intraoperatively and we assess the TFCC intraoperatively. If you have a, a foveal detention of a very important DRUJ instability, there is an indication to uh, to repair uh, the TFCC uh, in the acute uh, uh, situation. That's what I wanted to say. I hope I, I answered. Yes, absolutely. There's one more question to you. So what are the common complications of wrist arthroscopy and uh, how do you deal with them or prevent them? As I told you in my lecture, the common complications, uh, there, there was this uh, very interesting uh, multicenter study they included in 2016 more than 10,000 uh, uh, wrist arthroscopies. It was a questionnaire that was sent to the US members. And it appeared that uh, the first, uh, I don't know if you remember, the first complication was the color to achieve the procedure. So it was a lack of uh, experience in wrist arthroscopy. And uh, I would say the most important is, is are not the complication, is how to avoid the complication. And the first step is really the learning curve. And um, the most common, when we have the learning curve, when we have the experience of face arthroscopy, I, I would say the, uh, the, the most, most common, common complications, complications are the complications related to uh, finger tractions uh, that are not so serious. Uh, we have some uh, complications that are specific uh, to the surgery uh, we uh, perform. For example, if we uh, perform a foveal reinsertion with a, a direct foveal uh, incision here in the medial part on the ulnar side. Uh, we can injure uh, the dorsal branch of the ulnar nerves. And um, globally, I would say the serious complications decrease really dramatically with the, uh, the, the experience. So uh, learning curve is important, and uh, this, uh, for me, uh, at one point, the serious complications are not so frequent. I, I think the, uh, the complication you mentioned about the nerve injury is important. They are important, but there are uh, symptomatic. Be, yes, sorry. That will cause that will cause problem neuromas and uh, sometimes. Uh, like uh, CRPS, etc., post operative, isn't it? So, what yes. is your tip to avoid nerve injuries apart from what uh, I wanted to say in my lecture is that we have uh, that was that was described by Terry Beeple very, very early in his book. Yeah. Uh, the uh, we have specific uh, steps to uh, to systematically follow to avoid uh, this uh, kind of injury, for example, for the nerve. Uh, my fellows, my students ask me how to avoid uh, those complications. We need to spread. When we create the uh, portal, we need really to take the time to spread the subcutaneous tissues because we dissect them. And after, we, th there is no uh, real, uh, we decrease uh, the risk of injuring the subcutaneous nerves. Yeah. And the second point is, like, you should not, you, you correctly said that. But I don't know if I'm just highlighting for the audience's sake, you should not get the number 11 blade and go like knee arthroscopy. You have to cut only the skin. Exactly. And, and to pull the skin a little. 
pull the skin and then put the mosquito forceps, puncture the joint and open up. If you do that way, your superficial plane nerves will get out of the way. Yes, you decrease the, the risk of complications and- uh, so The uh, other complications are, uh, will settle down, but this one will cause- I, I, uh, the, This one and the tendons, it is the same for the tendons. And never use uh, uh, an 11 uh, blade scalpel. It is too, no. uh, it's too dangerous for reciproscopy because yeah. uh, it's a very, very small. We are not in the mm -hmm. knee. We, are, we have a very small uh, joint and uh, always uh, 15 uh, blade scalpel. Yes. Uh, there are some systematic, if you have the, the, uh, the chance or the opportunity to read the Whipple book, it is very, uh, it's very interesting. Like <clears throat> uh, all the, 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 the systematic uh, the steps to follow are described in this book. Do you use Yes, after 25 um, resarthroscopy a year, and after 50 resarthroscopy a year, the, uh, the, the complications rate decreases really uh, uh, because we, we are very used to the landmarks, to the portals, and uh, uh, after, it's not a game because it's a surgery, but uh, it's really easier. Yes. Post-op rehab is same for all my patients. So basically, uh, that's what I was highlighting. The primary stability is by the ligaments. We repair the lateral collateral ligaments. And second, the secondary constraint is by the radial head. So you restore the height, or if it is not possible, you replace the radial head. So these two will address that radial lateral column. If the coronoid is a big chunk, a basal fragment, I fix it. If it is only anterolateral facet, could be left alone. So at the end, I also check the medial collateral instability in the coronal plane. If it is stable, I will leave it. If it is unstable, I will fix it. So if you fix all the problem, which are the cause, there is no absolute need for putting the patient in plaster. So first thing I do, no plaster post-operative. So let them have a compression bandage or a tubi fix or a tubi grip and then mobilize as comfortables. If you have seen my post-op videos, all post-op I do arrange. I check the flexion extension of the elbow. I check the rotation. I show that to the patient. See, this is what I have achieved. Now it is your job to move it. Ice pack, cryo compression, mobilize early. Elbow likes movement. If you put in plaster, and then you have to fight with the stiffness which we have caused. That's a good question. Because when you have some young patient, you have shattered radius. We would like to spend more time to fix these smaller, smaller fragments. But our aim is to get an, as much anatomical reduction as possible. But the key criteria is this. At the end of that surgery, you should be able to supinate and pronate the forearm. If you are not able to do that, that means the stability is not being achieved. If you have a small one piece, like say 10%, 15% of the radial head fragment is crushed, but 85, 90% of the head fragment you are able to reconstruct, I'm happy with that. Because that is not going to affect your rotation of the forearm and also flexion extension arc. So it should be enough rigidity fixation so that to allow forearm supination pronation to a satisfactory range. That is a criteria. Okay. Now, we used to have, <laughs> we used to have a lot of this plating before. Now we have come off. We are not plating anymore much. 
The reason being, the plate you have to cut the annular ligament, you have to put a big plate, the plate will also block, and it doesn't give stability to the far cortex fragment. So what we do tend to do nowadays is the tripod type of configuration. Basically, fix the fragment, not to the opposite fragment, but in an oblique tripod configuration to the shaft metaphysis. If you do that, bipod or tripod, that gets very good fixation. So that is also another point to get maximum stability of the radial head. Right. So like you already mentioned, elbow is a joint that likes movement. Yes. Elbow is also a joint that gets stiff very fast. So yes. any tips and tricks on how to avoid stiffness in the elbow surgery? I think the one is, if the elbow is stable, like simple elbow dislocation, mobilize. Yes. If the elbow is, you think, unstable, fracture dislocation, then you have to understand what is the basic pathology that is leading to the instability and address it. If you repair the collateral ligament, then there is no need for you to protect any plaster. So you can, uh, you know, it is totally safe to start early mobilization. The problem comes in now is part surgery. Most of the uh, orthopedic surgeons do part of it. Like they do the radial head, sometimes they fix the radial head, but they leave the lateral collateral ligament unrepaired. Right. Number, two. Number two, they sometimes go in the wrong approaches. See, for example, if you go more uh, postolaterally in the elbow, you will be damaging more. You have to stay anterior so that you don't damage yourself much more postolateral capsule to create instability. For example, a simple communicative fracture radial head, I have seen people trying to fix it, but the result is the radial head is still submerged. If that happens, your elbow will get stiff. So at the end of the surgery, the radial head should be aligned to the capsule. If it is fixation or if it is replacement. Right. Absolutely. So great point from both the speakers and I'm sure all the audience at the venue as well as on online portals have benefited a lot. So thank you thank very you. much, Dr. Alam, Dr. Ram. And thank, thank you, you Sasinder. Thank you and congratulations to everyone for uh, the organization. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dr. Sasinder, for organizing. Bye. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot.